Hello, folks. This is just a reminder that there's a Lepster meetup happening in London this Sunday, the 28th of July, 2019, at 2 p.m. And I can confirm now that I will be coming. I am coming to the meetup. Um, I'm going to be in London this weekend, and so I'm going to come uh, to the meetup in order to take part, meet some listeners, have a drink, maybe play some board games, and generally have a laugh with you if you're coming. I'll also be accompanied by James, my brother, and two of our friends. That's the plan. I can't completely guarantee that they will be joining me, but uh, they've said that they're up for it, so I expect that uh, they'll be there too. But at the very least, you'll get me, and uh, hopefully you'll get... uh, James and a couple of friends too. So uh, I've spoken to Zdenek Lukas, the guy who's actually hosting the meetup, and he says that there are, I think, five or six uh, uh, people confirmed so far. I expect there'll be more. So where is it? Well, the Fitzroy Tavern near Oxford Street and Tottenham Court Road in central London. The full address is 16 Charlotte Street, London, w one t 2LY and put that postcode into your Google Maps app or equivalent and it should direct you there. W1T2LY. It's actually W1T space 2LY. That's the postcode that you'll need. When? It's going to be 2 p.m. on Sunday, the 28th of July. That's this coming Sunday. The host is Zdenek Lukas. You'll recognize him in the pub because he will be the guy with the board games. There'll be someone there with some board games on the table. That is Zdenek, and he's your man, okay? If you're coming, please send Zdenek an email just to let him know that you'll be there so that he has an idea of how many people to expect. His email address is teacherzdenek at gmail.com. You know how to, pr- uh, you know how to spell teacher, but Zdenek is spelt Z-D-E-N-E-K. Teacherzdenek at gmail.com. Just say, hi, Zdenek. I'm coming to the meetup. See you there buy and then add your name obviously you know you know your own name you do good okay so that's that uh come along if you're in london it would be nice to see you um and um chat with you i'm i'm not sure i can stay for the entire thing but certainly i will be making an appearance and it'll be good to meet you okay right so moving on uh the sponsor for this episode is italki let me just tell you about them for a minute or so. So if you want uh, one-to-one lessons in a very convenient way, uh, maybe you're looking just to improve your English and you're trying to find a teacher, you can have lessons with italki using Skype or similar software. Yeah, look no further. italki is the service for you. They have loads of teachers to choose from. It's a very user-friendly service. You can schedule a series of lessons or just a one-off lesson if you want. You can choose to have conversations with error correction or more specific things like grammar for accuracy, pronunciation work, lessons for different professions, exam preparation or job interviews. Whatever you need, you can find a qualified teacher for it on italki. And once you've gone through the process of finding a teacher and booking some lessons then next thing you know you're you've got your own one-to-one teacher who teaches you through skype or through some other software and when your lesson's finished you just close your computer and go about your day it's really convenient and great uh, when you buy a lesson italki will send you a voucher which you can use for a free lesson in the future that is the offer that they have for you it's basically buy one get one free at the at the beginning so to get the offer go to teacherluke.co.uk slash talk or just click an italki logo on my website okay right so let's get this episode started properly and here is the jingle you're listening to luke's english podcast for more information visit teacherluke.co.uk So, hello listeners, how are you? I hope you're doing well. Here is the second of a pair of episodes that I recorded a couple of weeks ago while I was on holiday with my family in England. That's the same holiday during which I got the two flat tyres on the car that you heard all about in the last episode. Um, I've had quite a few comments about that episode. It seems people really enjoyed it, which is very nice to know. So, during the holiday... My wife, our daughter, my parents and my brother all travelled down to the south coast of England where we spent some time at the beach in places like Lyme Regis, Seaton, West Bay and other parts of the Jurassic Coast as it's called. Yes, that's the Jurassic Coast, that's the name of that 
area of coastline on the south coast of England. The Jurassic Coast, not Jurassic Park. We didn't go on holiday in Jurassic Park. No, because that's not a real holiday resort. You should know. It's just a film, obviously. That wasn't a documentary. Those weren't real dinosaurs, okay? No. So we spent a week on the Jurassic Coast. I know what you're saying now. You're going, but Luke, what's the Jurassic Coast? Are there any dinosaurs there? Well, there sort of there are dinosaurs there actually. So here's a quick um, extract from Wikipedia, which should explain. So the Jurassic Coast is a World Heritage Site on the English Channel, uh, on the English Channel coast of southern England. It stretches from Exmouth in East Devon to Studland Bay in Dorset, a distance of about 96 miles, and it was inscribed on the World Heritage List in mid-December 2001. The site spans 185 million years of geological history, coastal erosion having exposed an almost continuous sequence of rock formation covering the Triassic, Jurassic and Cretaceous periods. Ooh, nice, nice, lovely, classic periods, weren't they, those ones? Dinosaur fans are probably loving this. Ooh, my favourite periods, Luke. Triassic, Jurassic and Cretaceous, a classic time. Um, So basically, in that area, the rock that is exposed there is from these periods and as we know you probably know those those periods were rich in um in dinosaur activity and all sorts of weird prehistoric creatures so at different times this area has been desert shallow tropical sea and marsh marsh is like sort of wetland and the fossilized remains of the various creatures that lived here have been preserved in the rocks so basically there are loads of fossils to be found there including dinosaurs so yes there are dinosaurs down there on the jurassic coast but they're just they're just a bit dead that's all they've probably been dead for about 185 million years and they've like sort of become stone they've become fossilized but anyway i digress there into prehistory um and different creatures, ancient creatures. But um, speaking of ancient creatures, uh, more recently, my family had an English coastal holiday on the Jurassic Coast. And yes, the weather was fantastic. Blue sky, sunshine, not too hot. It was just right. And I'm not even joking. I'm not even being ironic. It was. I'm totally serious. The weather was fantastic. Uh, I know most of you will be like, ha he must be joking. No, I'm not. I'm serious. It, the weather was great. And while we were there spending time on the beach, yes, we did spend several days on the beach doing usual beach type things like swim. I swam in the sea and all that stuff. While we were there, James and I decided that it might be a good idea for us to record a podcast all about the English seaside experience. So that's what this is about. Not really about dinosaurs. I may have given you the impression where I was going to talk about dinosaurs and stuff, but there's a little bit of dinosaur men- a couple of mentions of dinosaurs but no the english seaside experience that's what we're talking about so what is it really like at the beach in england when you go on holiday there what kind of beaches can you find in england what are the typical things that happen at the beach what sort of things can you see and do there what is the culture and history of the english seaside that is what we attempted to achieve in this episode I say attempted because it was actually quite difficult. Um, I mean, the subject is actually quite a big one with lots of things to include, but it was difficult mainly due to the conditions in which we recorded the conversation. So I I recorded this in my parents' living room. The audio quality is good, uh, I reckon. Uh, But we recorded it quite late at night after everyone else had gone to bed. Uh, We'd eaten a fairly heavy meal that evening because my mum is a great cook, and so we always completely stuff our faces with food while staying with my parents. It's just like, more, please, more, more. And then, oh my God, I'm so full. Uh, So late night, we were full, quite sleepy. Also, the holiday had been quite active with lots of sun and fresh air. And of course, we had spent a long and tiring day on our unexpected road trip the day before. As a result, the vibe of the episode is quite sleepy and generally quite low energy. Now, actually, listeners, this is what I wrote earlier. This is the introduction I wrote earlier. This is before I'd actually edited the episode. So I've just finished re-listening to the conversation and sort of editing a little bit here and there. And actually, 
It's not as low energy and sleepy as I thought. But anyway, I'm going to continue with my introduction here. So slightly sleepy vibe. In fact, James, who was sitting on the sofa, became steadily more horizontal as the recording went on. At one point, he even lies down to continue podcasting in the fetal position with his eyes closed. Now, I can get quite frustrated and irritable sometimes while recording with James. I think it's just a brother thing. You know, brothers sort of uh, kind of sometimes rub each other up the wrong way. So I get sometimes a bit irritated with James because I'm trying to produce nothing less than top, top quality English podcast content for my international audience of listeners. And I sometimes fear that his general sleepiness will be interpreted by you as a lack of enthusiasm. And I wouldn't want that on the podcast, would I? No, I, I, I always want nothing less than 100% enthusiasm in my episodes. So at certain moments, you will hear me getting quite angry. And actually, I've, I have very nearly gave up the recording at one point. I was ready to stop. But James assured me that he wasn't about to fall asleep and that he would, at the very least, keep his eyes open in an effort to stay conscious while podcasting. Um, so there is some strong language, and that means swearing, things like, you know, the F word, the F bomb, as people call it. There's a bit of swearing. And just other moments when I start kind of having a go at James, showing my irritation and trying to keep the energy up. Now, I could have edited those bits out, but I've chosen to keep them in because having listened back to this recording, I actually think they're quite funny and entertaining. And after all, I want my podcast to be authentic. And what's more authentic than the sounds of genuine bickering between two brothers? So in any case, um, there are only a few moments of mild arguing and swearing. I mean, not that much bickering. In fact, having listened back to it, as I said, it's actually quite pleasant. It's quite nice. Uh, but any moments of tension are quite normal between James and me. But, you know, we love each other, really. And as I said before, I now only really want to express my gratitude to James for agreeing to be a guest on the podcast again, when he probably just wanted to go to bed. So anyway, let's begin. So come with us now as we enter my parents' comfortable living room late on a warm evening in July, as James and I raid our dad's drinks cabinet, share a glass of Scotch whiskey together, and attempt to explain the sights, sounds, and perhaps smells of the English seaside in all its glory. And here we go. Is this how you normally talk? Um, depends on the situation. It sounds like you're sort of whispering a bit. It sounds like we're both kind of whispering slightly like David Attenborough, maybe. Well, as we witness. Here we are on the podcast, whispering... For no apparent reason. Well, we can just say it's fairly late. Everyone else has gone to bed and we don't want to wake them up. We can say that now because I'm, I'm recording. Oh. What's going on? Where are we? We're in our parents' house uh, after a family holiday mm -hmm. to celebrate our mum's birthday. This is the holiday during which um, we had the flat tyre incidents. Is that episode going to be before this one? Then? I think that episode will be before this. It's a pretty dynamic episode. I hope you enjoyed it. <laughs> <laughs> Action-packed, thrilling, live, un unplanned, un un raw and uncensored. <laughs> <laughs> uh, what did we do on that holiday, amongst other things? We went to the seaside. We did. We spent some time on the beach in England. And some of you out there might be thinking, but... You don't have, you can't go to the beach in England and do normal things that people do on the beach in England, can you? Well, you can, and we do. We did. We do. <laughs> we do, and we did. The stereotype. The reason I say that is because I suppose there's a stereotype around the world about uh, England, which is it rains all the time and it's cold, right? And when people think of England, they probably think of stuff like. You know, the Houses of Parliament and Buckingham Palace and London and things like that, right? It's also, listeners, it's quite late. So if you hear the sounds of yawning going on in the background, sorry, that's purely, completely reasonable because everyone else has gone to bed and here we are recording a podcast late into the night. You see, you see how committed <laughs> we are to podcasting, international and I, podcasting. And I haven't even got a beer. Do you want a beer? 
No, I think I might have. See if there's any whiskey or something. We could have a little drop of whiskey. Yeah, Dad's well, you, you keep recording and I'll, I'll see if I can find some whiskey. Go ahead. You'll need glasses. I mean, not... Oh, I, I see perfectly well, thank you. I mean, glasses to drink out of. Oh, the... Oh, so funny. Um, so, yes, I was talking about the stereotype of... Many stereotypes of England that people just imagine that it's cold and raining all the time and that you couldn't possibly enjoy spending time at the beach like you know some of you listening to this will have amazing beaches maybe you're from a country that has the you know the mediterranean coast and oh i mean that's so those are proper beaches right sun shining it's boiling hot all the time and the sea is not freezing cold and you might kind of think about England and think that's ridiculous. It's sort of this industrial place uh, where it's cold and all that stuff. But ah, not actually true, not technically true. Uh, We do have beaches. Of course, the UK is um, a series of islands. It's my dad sneezing in the background. I don't know if any of you could hear that. You probably couldn't. Unnecessary details, Luke. It's late at night. Forgive me. Um, the UK, of course, is surrounded by water. And so, yeah, we've got loads of coastline. And some of that coastline is in the form of beaches. Some of it's all rocky and there are just cliffs and things. Not really a place that where you can safely spend a lot of time. Because you'd fall off, wouldn't you? If you went to a cliff, a big rocky cliff with uh, with your beach towel and stuff that's that's a nice serving of whiskey james has just found in the cupboard a bottle of what is that f- famous grouse which is i guess a blend of scottish um uh scotch whiskey grain and malt whiskey blend it's kind of a standard fairly average quality scotch it's all right he says anyway it's going to be it's got a bit of water mixed with that. Is that normal? Do, do people normally add water to their whiskey? Depends. We can't hear you. You're not, you're not speaking into the microphone. Depends on the individual's taste. Okay. I like to mix it with a little bit of water. That's what the um, the really... Uh, I can't think straight. It's a bit late. It's what the... Connoisseurs. Connoisseurs. That's the word I was looking for. That's what the connoisseurs do. But normally with uh, malt whiskey, not, not blended whiskey. It's going to be one of those episodes, ladies and gents. Right. Okay. Cheers. Anyway, cheers. Nice one. Mm. Not bad. Warming. <laughs> I mean, it's the middle of summer, and we're drinking warming drinks to, um, to keep us to keep us warm. Mm. What do you, what taste? Can you give us a description of the taste? Tastes like whiskey. <laughs> the sort of thing that cowboys drank in the uh, in the Wild West. Yeah, I don't really normally drink whiskey, but it just feels a bit late to be drinking beer somehow. Mm, I know what you mean. I mean, we've eaten quite a heavy meal, so um, that's what, that's the point of whiskey, right? When you don't want to consume a lot of liquid, liquid but you still want to get slightly drunk. So the thing about <laughs> beer is that that's, a, that's quite a lot of liquid. And it's like it's, a meal. And it's carbonated as well, so it kind of fills you up quite a lot. And you don't necessarily want to have that after you've eaten and uh just you know fairly soon before you go to bed this is rambling i told you I, I, don't worry i'm not what is the, what's the criticism I said, to, I said to james before we started recording i said i really try to make episodes about certain subjects and they always go off on major round tangent rambles but that is the essence of what this is that's what i okay, do on the okay. podcast don't get up tight you it's just fine. i follow the train i chase the train into wherever it goes okay um Okay, so we're talking about beaches, and I was saying that uh, the UK does have beaches. We've got different, all sorts of different types of coastline around. Mm. I mean, we've got to talk about England, really, and maybe Wales, because we haven't spent a lot of time in Scotland, okay, have we? So we can't really talk about Scotland. Mm, okay. So it's, let's uh, just talk about England, what we know. All right. Um, there are quite a lot of... Um, Different types of coastline around of, the country. Lots of nice coastline. There's uh, sandy beaches. There's big, long expanses like Norfolk's got a lot of huge 
expanse of sandy beach. Because Norfolk and in East Anglia generally is very flat. And um, so you get these large sort of um, open uh, flat uh, beaches without cliffs behind them, for yeah, example. Yeah, yeah. Uh, where we were was um, Norfolk. No, I'm sorry, was Devon and Dorset, uh, is which is more, which is in the south coast, southwest. Yeah, southwest, and they have uh, more rocky terrain. Some beaches are sandy, like Lyme Regis, which is quite a famous one. But you know, Lyme Regis, the the, the sandy beach at, at Lyme Regis, that's sand that's been imported in. Bullshit. It's true. If the if it wasn't if the sand wasn't there, it'd all just be um, what do they call it? Uh, pebbles. Pebbles. Yeah. Pebble beach. Is that right? Yeah, it's true. Yeah, that sand was imported in and added onto the to the coast the, you, to the beach there. You you you're really telling me that whole thing was a deception? It's all fake. It's fake all sand. Fake beach. Well, most of you it's quite. You didn't actually experience that. That none of that actually happened. Um, it's all fake. Well, okay, I like pebbly beaches just as much anyway. Do you? Yeah. I'm not really a beachy type person. I don't really get the whole vibe of sitting on a bit of sand and burning. Yeah, I know exactly what you mean. Um, By the way, what are pebbles, we should s- say? Small stones, small rocks. <laughs> Why did you say it in that voice? It's so like saying rocks in an American accent. Mm-hmm. Um, they're small pebbles, round roundish they make a good noise when you're crunching along on them um you can throw them at things mm-hmm. um but it's not the same as being on a sandy beach is it because the sandy beach you can it's comfortable between your toes and uh it's soft and you know you can put your towel down and <laughs> it's comfortable right yeah i mean we did spend a day on the beach and i just basically slept <laughs> <laughs> what, a su- what a surprise, <laughs> listeners. Luke went for a swim. Sounds like he didn't quite wake up. I'm just making fun. I went for a swim. Impressive. Why is that impressive, going for a swim at the beach? That's what you're supposed to do at the beach. Because it can it? be quite cold. Mm. Um, but on a hot day, it's very refreshing, uh, apparently. So, I mean, like, obviously, um, England has got different coasts with different seas. So... Down there in Devon or Dorset, the Jurassic Coast, it's called, by the way, folks, because of um, the, uh, the 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 geology of the area. There's like lots of ju- Jurassic rock, rock from the Jurassic period. In fact, there's lots of uh, fossils that you can find uh, along the coastline there. Fossils of, you know, old like creatures that uh, uh, died and then turned into stone, right? <laughs> oh, God. <laughs> oh God! I think you're turning into stone. Oh dear! Sometimes it's hard to to, to podcast for learners of English because you kind of like have, you know you, you talk and you realise that sometimes people just have no context for what you're talking about. No one knows what we're talking about, and maybe even some of the you know just certain words they don't understand. You're making it worse. You started out talking about seaside sand, rocks, stone. Yeah. Understandable. Now you're talking about Jurassic coastline. Well, that's the name of that area of the of the, uh, of the coastline. It's called the <laughs> Jurassic Coast. And why, you know, why is it called the Jurassic Coast? People are going, well, what are there dinosaurs there? Well, yes, actually, yes, yes there, there are. are. There are Loads dinosaurs everywhere. Fossils of dinosaurs, um, and also seagulls, which are like modern dinosaurs. If you watch Jurassic Park, and they're s- just as vicious as any dinosaur you care to mention. Seagulls, s- gulls, gulls. What are they? Seabirds, not just seabirds, but generally live by the sea. They're large, winged, uh, birds. <laughs> avian species. Um, they're birds, basically. They're big, they're, big, bloody, mad birds that fly down and eat your lunch. They're those white birds that you get at the beach. Herring gulls. Herring gulls are the, the specific... Uh, they're big white birds with grey wings, and they've got a little red spot on their beak, which looks like blood, mm. which is quite cool. Do you know why they've got that there? For the babies. That's right. So to encourage their young to um, take Feed. take food from from the mother or father's bird's mouth. But they're they're quite nutty, aren't they? And they'll they've realised that the beach and all the tourists is a good source of food and protein for them. <laughs> so they um, <laughs> instead of instead of scavenging for like dead fish and stuff like mm-hmm. they should do, they eat your fish and chips. And they're and very they're, good at it. They're they're they they're thieves. 
they're, they they're marauders. The thieving, thieving little bastards. Yeah. I mean, we're they're quite big as well, and they can be quite scary if you're not used to it. Um, it's quite funny as well watching people have their food taken off them. So where we were, listeners, at Lyme Regis, which is down on the Jurassic Coast, as I said. What's funny about that? <laughs> He's, he took some, he drank some whiskey and kind of snorted. Was that you laughing or were you reacting to It was to me the... kind of trying not to laugh. Okay. I don't know why. Um, so at Lyme Regis, uh, it's common for people as it is in many other resorts around the country, uh, to get things like fish and chips or crab sandwiches and stuff from the local places along mm. at, at the beach. Fish and chips were lovely. Yeah. and But you've got to be very careful um, when you've got your fish and chips in, ha- in your hand because the, the, the seagulls these days are extremely bold and confident and they will fly in and grab them out of your hand. In fact, um, someone that we met down there, told us that they'd seen a seagull actually grabbing food out of someone's mouth. Really? Yeah, ice cream. The, the person was eating ice cream and the seagull came down and snatched the ice cream out of the person's mouth. Great, I'd love to see that. Yeah. I'd like to see them take a small dog as well. That would be good. <laughs> I mean, there's lots of dogs there and I wouldn't mind if a few of those got taken by seagulls. <laughs> you don't like dogs? Mm, this is going to really... Yeah, because, you know, everyone loves dogs around the world, of course, and they're all going to hate you now. Like, I don't, he doesn't like dogs. What kind of monster is he? I don't he? hate them. I really don't hate them. I just don't like them either. Well, what's wrong There's with them? There's just too many of them, and they're, they're nasty little things. They're, no, they're not. They're lovely. They're cute. They're, oh, they're affectionate. God, I've really, they're loyal. I've turned your whole listen of... Alienated. Face, alienated everyone again. It's not that I don't like them. You know, in places like where people listen to this podcast, people are passionately pro canine in these areas. You know, people love dogs, James. I just they love dogs a bit more annoying. Than... Why? I don't know. It's probably my fault. Because they bark and they and they uh... they create disgusting poo that you have to <laughs> avoid. And uh... I have to be honest, all the dogs that we came across, and we came across loads of them. They were all fine. Like I never had. I didn't have one problem with a dog this holiday. They're not a problem. Oh, you just hate them. But they're not a problem. <laughs> <laughs> they're not a problem. It's kind of a bit of a joke within the family that we we yeah. pretend that we don't like dogs for comic effect. It's we're not a dog fam. We're not a dog loving family. You know, we've never had dogs. We we've had cats, but we've never had dogs. And it's kind of a, it's sort of a. It's kind of one of those family things joke. that when you see other people adoring their dogs you just think there's something a bit wrong with them and maybe they're a bit simple and the way people talk to their dogs as well like they're humans like they have full-on conversations to them it's like the dog doesn't understand what you're saying it just wants to eat the food that you're going to give it eventually yeah but i mean in defense of dogs but i've met many dogs that i love and know and love and my friends have got dogs and they're great and I think they perform a useful function when they're guiding blind people across the road. That's it. Should they, cause they should only be <laughs> they should only be for blind and, old, they, and elderly people. They're very good working on farms, and I understand old people rely on them for company. And mm-hmm. uh, everyone else should just get rid of their dogs. <laughs> <laughs> you like, let me bring this back to normality. Bring this back. I like dogs. So okay. listen, like my, I quite like some dogs. My daughter, your niece, who's eighteen months old, uh, is loves cr- dogs. Crazy about dogs already, and um, she spent so much time this holiday having loads of fun spotting dogs. And every time she saw a dog, she'd point she at points it, at it, and go. Uh, like you know make noise and she started to speak english this holiday and the owners generally go do you want to meet she's the, very nice she's very friendly to about the dog and we look at the dog and think yeah they always say that don't they mm, or it rips your head off it's like when you see a dog uh, owner walking in uh, in the park with their dog and the dog looks like a ravenous monster like a rottweiler like frothing at the mouth and and barking. Oh, don't worry. He doesn't teeth. bite. It's like he's lovely. Much. It's like he doesn't look lovely. I have to be honest. He doesn't bite. He looks. Much. He looks like he would murder me and eat me. He'll if let he had go. A he'll he'll unlock his jaws eventually. <laughs> anyway, <laughs> but but from my the point of view of my young daughter, dogs are wonderful, cute. Uh, and it is very sh- sweet when you see a nice uh, dog owner walk over with its dog and introduce the dog to your daughter. And, and your daughter pets 
the dog and strokes its soft fur and the dog looks very happy and it's a very cute scene yeah and uh my daughter gets so excited she kind of like she can't control herself like she's almost <laughs> jumping up and down because she's so excited to meet the dog and she loves animals doesn't she yeah all animals like she she loves to see birds and you know all of those different horses things. she loves that horse oh we oh there was a God. horse uh we st- so we stayed in a in a house on a farm and um, there was a horse in the field next to the house. And she was nuts about this horse. And you could see the horse from different windows in the house. So we'd be sitting down. <laughs> she'd just at point bre- at it. She'd be sitting, go, down ah. at, at, sitting down at breakfast. We're eating, we're feeding her. And she just goes, ah, and points out the window and says something sounding a bit like the name of the horse, which was Leo. Weird name for a horse. Leo is the name of a lion, isn't it? Leo the lion, right? I'm going to call a horse, horse Leo. It doesn't Le- sound like a sort of pet name. Not well, Leo. Not that they're a pet. No, horses aren't pets, but... Um, you mean it sounds like a person's name? Yeah. Like, it's like is, Kevin. You wouldn't call like, the horse Kevin, would you? This is Michael, the horse. <laughs> you think they normally called something like Cherry Blossom or yeah. something stupid for the racehorses, like uh, Thatcher's Revenge or something <laughs> like that. Or um, Racehorses have yeah. always got ridiculous Race names. Racehorses, yeah. Uh, but like a farm horse, you'd call it what? What would you call it, like Rosie or something? But that's a person's name as well. Anyway. We're, we're tangenting. Yeah. But anyway, this horse was called Leo. And so my daughter would uh, point and go, you know, what would she say? Yeah. Yeah. Sounded or a bit something. like Leo. Yeah. She's only she's, 18 she's months old. She's only young. Give her a break. Uh, but anyway, she loves animals. Um, so from, from my daughter's point of view, dogs are wonderful. And we did see lots of dogs there. And uh, they were all lovely. And they're all lovely. Okay, dog lovers. Dogs Just are chill okay. out. They're fine. Yeah. Um, so, different types of beach, James. Right, right. Seagulls. Right, we were right. talking about seagulls. seagulls. You've got to watch out for your beach. fish. You've got to watch out for your fish and chips when you're so on the a beach. Lot, a lot of our beaches here aren't particularly sandy, although some of them are. A lot of them are quite uh, stony, rocky. Yes. Like, I quite like that. And they're quite um, often... They're not the kind of beaches you see in kind of Australian and American films. They're uh, more... Um, more Australian films, all those Australian films that we know and love <laughs> about beaches, about, set on beaches. Okay, there's no Australian <laughs> films about beaches, but um, maybe there are. Probably there are. might be. But anyway, or the it's, goal. It's not like a tropical beach. It's like a um, a so, stony hard beach. A lot of the British beaches, yeah, especially the further up north you get. Um, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. But some of them are sandy, and some of them you can play on and play games on and go surfing even in cornwall you can surf can i just can i mention just a few key beaches around the country go so for got, it because i can never remember yeah. the right one right so I'll, I'll go through them right so you've got brighton which is obviously just an hour south of london very stony beach not it's pebbles very... pebble beach right it's a lot of mods, people mods and rockers well wait a minute a lot of people a lot of tourists visiting the UK or visiting London will visit Brighton and they'll go to the beach and they'll see what it's like. It's a stony beach. A lot of people, a lot of my students in London that I used to teach who would go to Brighton would come back on the Monday and I'd say, what did you do at the weekend? And they'd say, we went to Brighton. And I'd say, what did you think? And they'd be disappointed by the beach because it it's was... not a very nice beach. Because it was pebbles. But it's you know it's these, not just the pebbles. It's just not a very nice beach. But the thing is that what maybe they expect from a beach experience is that kind of Mediterranean beach or something. Palm trees, coconuts falling on you, giant crabs, like skewers, um, pirate ships. Mm-hmm. That's the Caribbean. Twenty-four hours a day sunlight. I know that's not possible. <laughs> but, you it's know. in the North Pole. Yeah. There aren't many great beaches in the Arctic Circle, though, are there? B- b- uh, listeners in Murmansk. Unlikely. Listeners in Murmansk in, in Rus- Russia, you can confirm or deny. What are the beaches like up there in, in the middle of summer? 24 hours of sunlight, I expect. I don't know if you get 24 hours in, in Murmansk. Anyway, um, so Brighton, Pebble Beach. All right. And if you go to in a westerly direction, you end up, you know, places like, uh, let's say, Lyme Regis, um, which is also pebbly, but there's sand there, too. If you keep going, you get to Cornwall and you can kind of go round Cornwall and you get places like Newquay, which is a, a beautifully, beautiful sandy beach, golden sand, and you can surf there. <coughs> there's actually quite a strong surf scene in Newquay and Cornwall and stuff, although... 
Newquay is very, very busy with tourists now that nowadays. Mm. It's it's probably wouldn't be my recommendation just because it's so popular. Somewhere like um, uh, St Ives, if you can make it there, St Ives is a fantastic place. But it's also yeah. very busy with tourists in the, in in the peak seasons. D- impossible to park your car there. Yeah, it's a bit much sometimes. But if you can make it out to St Ives, it's it's fantastic. Beautiful beach, lovely yeah, golden lovely. sand. And Fistral Beach, where's that? That's in Cornwall, isn't it? Um, I'm not sure. I don't know. And then there are places like Port Isaac, which is a, a lovely little seaside town on the on the coast and uh, kind of nestled in, in, in within the hills there. Uh, and, uh, you know, English beaches are, or English coastal places are sorts of places where you meet sort of uh, old fishermen with grey beards and blue woolen jumpers and they're like no it's true i've never met an old fisherman in a blue jumper well you have but i don't i don't get out very much no um where are we going well i'm just trying to talk about the different types of beaches. okay sorry yes rocky beaches that's about it they're all flipping rocky no there's a lot of sandy beaches too. okay and some of them are sandy. (laughs) yeah all right like like for example newquay and uh st ives beautiful golden sand also norfolk as you mentioned before which is all the way over on the eastern side um long um open uh long flat sandy beaches there uh too what's blackpool like you've been there haven't you it's, it's sandy, isn't it? I think it's actually stony. Are you sure? Because um, I, I think you've got. You think you don't know. I went actually. in the off season when I last went, which was about thirty years. Does ago. Does that make a difference to the sand? Well, no. It means you're not going to be spending a lot of time on the beach when it's free, and it was night time when we were there. Where is Blackpool, by the way? Uh, well, let's see if the, he knows. Uh, west, on. yeah, west coast. Kind of um, northwest, northwest above, li- above say. north of Liverpool. Yeah, it's sandy. It's it's it looks it looks fantastic. When the tide is out at Blackpool Beach, you get this very um, long sandy. And they have beach. the uh, Blackpool illuminations, which is a load of lights. Think uh, Las Vegas, but in Blackpool, the Las Vegas of the North, isn't that what they call it? They do well. Some people optimistically call it that. Um, it's something about English, the English or the British seaside is um, quite depressing in a weird sort of way. How? Well, because they're not necessarily economically that strong. And in the summertime, they're very busy and full of tourists. And out the rest of the time, they can be quite desolate, empty, a um, bit of deprivation. Mm-hmm. Um, there's a slight melancholy to beaches out of to some of these uh, resorts, you could say, out of season. So in the winter and uh, any time except summer, really. And there's a sort of transient um, financial um, economy. So during the summer, it's very busy. And during the rest of the time, it's kind of quite quiet and a bit dead. And so... They can, I quite I quite like that though. See, the thing is, right, that um, if tourists go to the beach in England, they might be surprised at. I don't know how to describe it. Really, it's quaint. That's it's, a good word. You see that some some beach. That, okay, let's say there's two types of uh, beach in England. There are the upper sort of uh, class places, which are yeah, quaint and upmarket you're going to find like places to have tea and cake maybe just off the beach maybe some newer restaurants which are a bit more f- fancy is yeah, that the word a like bit more upmarket. expensive a bit more upmarket some upmarket restaurants where you get really because good seafood there's been a bit of a slight renaissance in uh, seaside towns in recent years some of them are becoming a bit more fashionable like margate apparently although i haven't been yeah. there for a long time has seen some people moving from london mm-hmm. and there's some kind of youthful energy around some of these smaller towns but some of them are still a bit not doing so well and some of them are um i can hear a baby i can't 
Okay. Look, uh, this is really hard work. It's so it late. It's so late. I'm so tired. <laughs> um, so we need to probably talk about the history of English seaside resorts a bit. Well, I haven't Some, done. I haven't done I, any research. You know, well, hold you? on. I can give a, a basic history on it. So there's 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 like let's say there's two types of beach resort. There's like the kind of slightly more upmarket places where you're going to get lovely seafood restaurants where they get the local fish from the local fish markets. They're like fishing towns and stuff like that where there might be small pleasant little beaches and probably some quite expensive properties in the area maybe um uh some bed and breakfasts that you can go and stay at and places like devon and dorset are a bit like that and cornwall as well but then also a lot of the beach resorts in the uk in england it's uh, certainly um are working class holiday resorts okay so that's because if you go back to the industrial revolution, right, when the railways were invented and, yeah. you know, England had arguably the first railways in the world, maybe France too, but certainly England was one of the first countries to have railways. Okay. And we were an industrial country, which meant that there were lots and lots of people working in the cities, working in factories, working in the industries. Okay. And when the railways happened, that allowed people to travel from the cities to other parts of the country um, fairly uh, easily without having to spend too much money. Suddenly, at that point, people working in inner city areas were able to go on holiday at the, at the beach in England. Okay? And as a result of that, a whole kind of culture of the seaside came about. Very good. Right? And it was... A, it was kind of a working class thing because if you were rich um where would you go i mean you you know you might even go abroad if you're really rich you might go you could have you could have gone on a grand tour of the world even yeah maybe or you would have gone to some of the more established and upmarket places in the uk possibly yeah but for the average working guy and gal yeah they could get to get a train or even a coach later on and, uh, and the, visit and the, the seaside and stay in a B and B, which is a bed and breakfast, a small, cheap hotel. Yeah. You, you wouldn't and be you able could to have your beach experience for a relatively cheap and affordable price. And in, involved in that is lots of cheap fun, family fun. And also if you live in, in one of the big cities like London, Manchester, something like that, um, you, you'd probably go to one of the beach resorts that's like as close as possible to this, the city that you live in. Yeah. So, so for the, for the big industrial uh, Northern cities like Manchester, um, it would be somewhere like Blackpool. So Blackpool became maybe the biggest beach resort of the North. And we mentioned before that it was like the Las Vegas of the North. That's because at Blackpool, um, all of these, uh, attractions and that was also around the time of the invention of the electric light bulb so they right. went to town on that and uh created big illuminated lights yeah which some are impressive some are less impressive and you could say it's a bit dated now but they they make a big deal out of the the nighttime stuff as well as the daytime yeah a lot of lights that, that look impressive at night and a lot of you know basically cas like sort of crappy casinos and places where you go to um you know just like las vegas imagine las vegas but smaller and in england and not a bit rubbish and yeah a bit kind of rubbish and and also there would be theaters and and things uh, showing popular entertainment musicals theater cinemas yeah stuff like that so you you know you'd go for a fun uh holiday at the be at the seaside and it's kind of working class culture isn't it yeah fish and chips sticks of rock what's rock sticks of Which rock is a uh, a candy or a sweet in a big stick, which is made out of melted sugar, it's I guess. It's just sugar, isn't it? And there's a clever way they can write the name of the resort through the rock. Yeah. 
I still don't know quite how they do that. I don't know how they do that either. But it's a whole stick of rock. You can just Google it. It's basically like a big stick of coloured sugar <laughs> and it wrapped up in plastic and you buy it at the seaside and then you eat and it. It's and it's got the name of the resort running all the way through it, yeah, so which if it is says, quite clever. If it says Blackpool in red sugar all the way through your white and blue stick of sugar... Uh, I'm sure it's more than just sugar. They have like different flavors. They have like peppermint flavor. Yeah, it's mainly like paste. Usually peppermint. Yeah, um, and it's you know like a sort of a cultural institution, isn't it? The 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 English seaside the stick resort. of rock. You'd have fish and chips, or whelks and eels, or whelks and uh, what are the other ones? Cockles and mussels. Cockles and mussels. So the, these are these are kind of uh, shellfish that uh, can easily be uh, you know found at the seaside and then are cooked and sold. But these days you don't you know you don't get all that they're stuff not really. As, they're not. As, there's some places up north you can still get whelks and cockles and mussels and stuff, but they're not as popular as they used to be. But some people love them, but they're not as posh as sort of oysters and um, uh, mussels. Well, you, you know, or, or, we did just say mussels, cockles and mussels. Oh, okay. But then, you know, it, you think about France, like some of the French resorts. Moul, Marignan. Yeah. Where, 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 it's not as posh as that. Yeah, there's there's like oysters. But you can get oysters in England. But they're, as I said, they, that's probably in the more upmarket places. But m- many of the seaside resorts will be more cheap and cheerful. And so you're getting kind of... Um, ice cream and fish and chips and um, and like uh amusement arcades it was kind of going back to the victorian era the sort of the invention of entertainment really Mm -hmm. Um, yeah and there's arcades where you can play pinball and games like that and um there's and there's piers we're going to talk about piers a pier pier is like a wooden structure that uh, goes out into the sea from a long way yeah and there's famously there's there are a pier, there's a pier in Brighton, which burnt down. Well, there was the one that burnt down, and then there's the new pier as well. And a pier is imagine like a big wooden bridge that goes all the way out into the sea, and then it just stops. Okay, and the idea is that it's like a wooden sort of uh, platform going out into the sea on on wooden legs, and on that pier you get all these things like you can have a fun fair on the pier right a fun you know things like roller coaster rides and merry-go-rounds and things like that on the pier and also you'd have amusement arcades this is these are places where you go and you put coins into the machines and you can play games and basically the the game is how how much money can you lose it seems to be the game yeah. um, and they have slightly saucy entertainment so what's that saucy slightly rude or um, suggestive sex S- not overtly se- sexual more innuendo based than anything else so what kind of thing does that mean like postcards maybe of of, of girls with their boobs out well maybe not exactly or not, just not rude as... slightly rude situations on a postcard like ooh, oh <laughs> <laughs> Like and, a, uh, a, a bad, a, bad a, jokes. Like a woman bending over to do something, and then there's a man there uh, where he's got an ice cream, and his ice cream is dribbling all over his hand or something. <laughs> oh, <laughs> a picture, and he's looking embarrassed, and you know. And it's a kind of um, a culture that is very English, I think. That kind of smut. <laughs> it's not. It's when it's not actually sexual. It's more suggestive. Yeah, and it's comedy, really. It's comedy. Yeah, it's turning something sexy into something funny because or naughty f- for us we still have some but maybe because of our protestant puritanical past that we have a weird relationship with sex where we still think that it's there's something slightly naughty about it and like, sort of funny and you something it's much to laugh at to, to get rid of the fear of it we, we, laugh at it yeah that we're uncomfortable about it not everyone uh, i'm not yeah <laughs> neither am i but we're it's something slight this slightly uncomfortable and shy about it and so we have to put comedy into it to make ourselves feel less uncomfortable it's a bit complicated but isn't it's it? it's a it's an aesthetic you could say the sort of end of a pier seaside style yeah that, and you can maybe put some examples on your website i'll try and there's... find some images or something that i can post on the website so people can see what i'm i'm talking about um what I, else are we going to talk about well, what else? What else? What, um, so, our day or two that we spent at the beach, right? You you said that you slept through most of it, but I did, I'm afraid because I'm I'm a bit like that sometimes. A bit of a sleepy person. 
um, as as people can hear from. I mean, he's even lying down while recording this, ladies and gents. To be fair to James, it is about half past twelve at midnight. Half past half past twelve at midnight. That's not English. It's half past midnight as we record this. So if we do sound half asleep and a bit confused. That's why, okay, folks. You see how committed, as I said before, how committed we are to podcasting. And um, oh, James is yawning. I also went for a wander around um, a vintage secondhand shop uh, while you were doing something else on the beach. <laughs> um, is that specific to English coastal? No, but you get stuff like that. You get like secondhand shops and sort of weird shops by the seaside and. Um, these days, it would be shops that sell, uh, you know, all the stuff that you need for the beach. And, and also, they would sell, uh, you know, tourist merchandise. Tat. Postcards and sort of like um, like signposts that look like they're signposts to the beach, but it's like something you put on your bedroom door, you know? Yeah, there's loads of that crap, And it's kind of, it's, it's stuff like, what would it say? Stuff like, you don't have to be mad to work here, but it helps. <laughs> That kind of thing, um, if you something remember, for the office. Like Beach Hut and um, stuff that's all made in China to make, make look like rustic English stuff, but it's actually just copies of old stuff. Yeah. Probably. Okay. Um, I don't know. It's, it's, there's a cheap and cheerful vibe to the seaside. Am I right? It's a kind yeah. of... Um, do you, do, um, can you get a suntan at the beach in England? You can get burned. You can get very sunburned if you're not careful. If, I mean, it depends on the weather, obviously. But uh, this holiday it was sunny for a whole week. Yeah, and this and was very hot sun. Like I had to put suntan cream on. I burnt my knees. This is the middle of July. Okay, listeners, we spent a week. Yeah, as I said, in on the south coast, and yeah, it was hot and sunny every day. Probably temperatures about 25 degrees on uh, the middle of the day. Even hotter. I which think. is, you know, it's, and for some people listening, it's like 25 degrees. That's not hot, but that is actually quite hot for I England. I think it was hotter than that. And it's good. 25 degrees is a good temperature because 30 degrees is too hot, in my opinion. I can't move can't or, do anything. or think anything above 30. Yeah, and if you, My you know, brain stops working. I, I, my, I start sweating uncontrollably. I start to think, okay, <laughs> I might die. This isn't funny anymore. Uh, I can't actually handle this. Um, this is a survival situation. <laughs> I need beer and I need a cold beer garden. Yeah, you need to desperately get into the shade. Like thir- anything yeah, about I, I don't like being in, in sun for a long period of time. No. Anything longer than an hour. I've been... I start to panic and I have to start running around looking for shade. I've been to beaches before in different places in the world where... It's freaking boiling, and I can't do anything. I, to an extent, I don't understand the culture of going to the beach. I love going to the beach in England because it's manageable. It, the, you know, it's never too hot, and if you get some shade, if you find a parasol that you can stick in the sand and get into the shade, then it's comfortable. It's quite cool and comfortable. You don't have to be at maximum, like, I'm about to die temperature. Uh, but I've been to... Some beaches where it's like, you know, you, you get down to the beach, right? And then the first thing you do is try and cover yourself up from the sun and you slather cream all over your skin. Why do we do that? Why do we want to go to the beach and then hide from the sun immediately? I don't really like putting on suntan lotion and then staying in the sun. I like to put on a bit for safety's sake, but generally just stay out of the sun. Yeah, and I like to be a bit brown. I like to get a bit of a tan, but I don't really like sunbathing. So if I, you know, if if I go to the beach, like for example, I went to Goa in India. Totally great place. Totally terrific. Uh, but um, it was too hot there, and so being on the beach there, and it's also the same in parts of France where it's hot in the summer, um, where you go down to the beach, right? And I want to bring a book with me, yeah? If I'm going to spend time sort of sunbathing on the beach, I want to bring a book. So I, if I lie on my back and I hold the book in the air above me, I can't see the book cause, because it's a silhouette against the, the sky. Right, James? Yeah. And if... <laughs> he's actually got his eyes closed. I haven't. I was blinking. It's very, very slowly. Um, and I feel then, like we're being quite noisy. Yeah, well, I'm trying to talk so that you'll actually, I don't know. I'm listening, I'm and listening. Then, 
And then, so I can't lie with my back on the sand or on the beach towel with a book above me because I can't see the book and the sun blinds me. And if I roll over and I've got the book down below me, you know, I'm above the book. The book is on the ground and I, I, the sweat just pours off my head and lands on the book. I can't, hand, I can't do it. So an English beach is just right for me because I'm not sweating. It's not too hot. And he's falling asleep. Fuck this. I'm not falling asleep. <laughs> um, I wrote don't some, turn it off. Don't turn it I off. I wrote some things down on little let's, bits let's of paper. Let's keep going. Let's keep going. I wrote things down on little bits of paper here. Okay? So we've been talking for about 44 minutes. We're nearly done. All right? And then we can just go to bed, listeners. Okay. I'm sn- Does it make a difference to the listening experience if I get angry? Does that make it better? No, it makes it worse. Are you sure? I think that it I, might make it makes, more makes fun. Makes my to experience worse. Yeah, but that doesn't mean it's for worse them. for them. That they might be finding this more engaging because well, you're more, getting irritable. The more with emotionally, me. Inv- I'm not. <laughs> I'm not necessarily getting irritated with you. I'm just, you know, sometimes just the world becomes a, a complicated okay. place. Luke's a the more man. emotionally engaged I am in this the more interesting and engaging it is to listen to okay whether that is a- anger and irritation or like just pure uh passion for the english seaside i don't know which one it is but i wrote some things down on um uh on bits of paper history of the seaside resort we've kind of done that a little bit we've got places like margate which is to the east of london Right, supposedly uh, quite trendy these days. Supposedly quite trendy but these I have, days. I haven't been there, so I don't know. But it's probably I don't know where you all come from. But for many people, it would be quite sort of a uh, um, I don't know, like a tacky sort of place. Tacky. How would you describe that? A bit shit. Yeah, it's kind of like stuff is made of like cheap plastic, and uh, it's not like the most high grade quality stuff it's That's all what i mean about slightly melancholy feeling of the seaside sometimes it's all made of very sort of cheap yet cheerful stuff right and you know and you they can the... be very quiet out of season we've said this already yeah we've okay, already said that go, so go. that's that piece of paper done okay candy floss oh forgot about that candy floss is another something... sugary snacky product something you can buy at the seaside what is candy floss it's fluffy sugar. Yeah. It's, it, how do they make candy floss? They spin it out of a spinner. And there's this big, I don't know exactly how drum. it works, but there's a big drum thing. And it f- turns the f- sugar into f- like thread almost, like cotton. It's like cotton wool. Yeah. And it but it's fluffs pink. up and you put a stick in and spin it. And the thing spins around and it attaches to itself and becomes a big fluffy cloud of sugar on the end of a stick so what you have is is a is a a stick in your hand with a big imagine a big fluffy pink cloud of sugar stuck to a stick i'm sure they have it it in other countries yeah they must have it in other countries we didn't well maybe we did invent it but uh one of our proud british inventions oh yeah shook a cloud of pink sugar on a stick yep this is what makes britain great hashtag (laughs) brexit oh god um so what else have we got? Candy floss is something you might find at the beach. Kiss me quick hats. I think they're a bit of a myth, but... What is it first? It's a, it's a bit of that end of the pier stuff. It's a little paper hat that you stick on your head and it says, kiss me quick. Fuck knows what that's all about. The idea is, I suppose, that because you're having such fun and you're so liberated by being at the beach that uh, someone might kiss you. And it's, so you've got a hat and it says, kiss me quick. And hopefully uh, a pretty lady would come and kiss you if you wear that hat isn't that it or is it an ironic thing it's not ironic i think it's sort of like saying i'm up for it it's like way we're at the beach we kiss me come and kiss me quick but no I'm one actually wears it. kiss me quick hats anymore no, no it's just an old-fashioned thing but it's still sort of a, a little cultural uh what's the word for it sort of feature of of uh an english seaside resort but it's the sort of thing you would see on a postcard but not necessarily actually do or or wear in the real world yes uh sticks of rock we've talked about that fish and chips of course because you know england's famous for fish and chips because we're surrounded by the sea so there's loads of fish i read a little thing while we're on holiday about the origins of fish and chips apparently it comes from the continent does it really (laughs) (laughs) and they said something like italians brought it to the uk 
and the first records of people selling fish and chips were continental type people from France and Italy. So, listeners, tourists, I don't know when. I don't you, have a date. For if that. you've been to England and you and you and you went, oh, well, English people eat fish and chips, don't they? Let's have some fish and chips, and you ate it, and you thought it was rubbish. Blame Italy, all right? <laughs> and their supposed great food culture, they are responsible <laughs> for fish and chips. Okay, thanks, I bloody, Italy. I bloody love fish and chips. Me too. But there, is good and, there are good fish and chips and bad fish and chips. If you're in London, don't have fish and chips. Oh, probably... no, there's some good ones in London. Really? Where? Oh, yeah. Um, Spitalfields Market. There's one called... Spittle... I can't remember what it's Spittle called. Spitalfields Fish and Chips. And don't worry, folks, we won't spit in your fish and chips. It's just the name of the place. One thing I've noticed that's very suspicious, a lot of them claim to be the best fish and chips in the UK. Yeah. And there seems to be a lot of them claiming that. Uh, Award-winning, best fish and chips in UK, Fish and Chips Awards 2017. You're like, well, how many fish and chip awards are there? Because (laughs) they all seem to think they're the best. (laughs) One for every single fish and chip shop. They've got a different award for it. Um, windswept is a word that I wrote down. Windswept. Very windy, cold. This is a good English holiday. Windy, cold. Your hat flies off. It's the sand blowing in your face. Uh, there's no sun. Uh, it's freezing. You've got a, uh, like a packer mac on, which is like a little fold up. Um, plastic, plastic, plastic raincoat. Raincoat. Um, you're really desperately trying to have a good time, pretending that you're having a good time. Actually, everyone hates it. <laughs> Shut up. <laughs> um, but when and you're eating, you're eating sandwiches on the beach, like against, like fuck you, I'm going to have a good time. And you're eating, pitting, picking sand out of your, like with a thermos of tea. Sounds lovely. On it, oh. I honestly think that it does sound nice. Imagine a, a windswept beach somewhere. With nobody on with it. With no one on it. And you found a place where it's, there's no one there. And the beach is is, um, is is wide and open. And there are like maybe some sand dunes in the background. And the sea, the tide is out. So the beach is really long and flat. And you can see the sea in the distance. And it's windswept. It's windy. So that means that... You know, well, you know what wind is, but windswept is an adjective to mean when a place has got wind coming through. And yeah, you might find a nice place in the sand dunes where you're protected from the wind. And it's actually quite warm there when it's not windy. And yeah, you've brought a packed lunch. You've got a thermos of tea and, you know, you've got a, a sweater on. So you're not cold. And you, you sit down there in the sand dunes and you have your lunch. It's, it's great. You get some sun. This is July we're talking about, folks. It's quite yeah. nice to go to sea side in winter, though. It's a different experience. It's not like, hey, this is great. It's more like oh, you just is, stare off. Is... You stare off into the into the horizon and kind of think about things and kind of breathe in the fresh air and kind of go, yeah. And then you go home and write a really good English novel. Yeah, and you, you, you sort of you come home and your your cheeks are very red because you've been out in the wind and the cold, and uh, it can be a nice experience, but just not in such a uh, obvious way. Yeah, it's a sort of invigorating experience. Yes, invigorating. Isn't it? You can go for a good sort of bracing walk along the beach. Yeah, and try not to fall off a cliff. And you you might go to the edge of the the water, and you know, see a dead crab. <laughs> <laughs> or kick it, kick it around with your shoe a bit and then go should we go back or you go you know you walk out into on along that flat beach and you find like pools of water with you have to be careful because the tide can come in very quickly actually quick disclaimer don't do check the tides does happen people do die in situations like that so mm, this is just this, be aware <laughs> the english seaside holiday so have a good time just make sure you don't die <laughs> just check the check you know what you're doing and don't go out on one of those uh, dinghies out onto the sea because you get swept out to sea and they'll never find you <laughs> <laughs> you're painting a very bleak picture i know it's it's a it's a joke but it's seriously a- do be careful <laughs> 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 don't you like it when you go out to you, you walk along a, a beach and the the sand has kind of gone into those little sort of how do you describe it the sand is you know what i mean like the sand has gone into little ridges oh yeah little um 
wind shape. No, things. it's like the, the water. Yeah, has, I know, I know. The I know. water has shaped the sand into like little wavy ridges yeah, under it's your feet. Really cool. And and the the sand is all sort of packed in and and um. That's, yeah. It's it's great. You can walk along it and yeah, leave little footprints behind you, and 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 you can draw huge things in the wet sand, like massive, yeah, drawings. If you so want to, and you can build big sand castles, and, and you can and, make a big pile of stones, and then you sit somewhere with a big handful of stones and try and knock over the big pile of stones yeah. with your smaller stones. We've spent a lot of good times on holiday with with our parents. That sounds might sound boring. Trust me, it's a very addictive game. When you when you are on, a, let's say you've gone on holiday with our parents, as we did, obviously, growing up, and they've taken you on a bracing three-mile walk along some desolate, barren coastline, which is actually very beautiful. Yeah, it and is beautiful. And you, you stop and you have your packed lunch in the sand dunes, and then you find a spot where there are lots of stones, and you p- make a pile of stones down the beach and then you walk back and you collect lots of stones together and you know this the your pile of stones are maybe sort of 10 feet away or you know further 10 meters away or further whatever and then you you spend you have a little competition with each other see who can uh throw the stones and hit your pile of stones first it's actually lots of fun (laughs) that's the kind of holiday we had Throwing stones at, on other a, stones at other stones on a barren, <laughs> desolate uh, beach with nobody else in sight. With no one else in sight, in sight but that's the you've good thing just, about going in winter. But you've just eaten a chocolate bar, and and life is pretty good. Um, what else? Uh, I do like to be beside the seaside. Oh, I do like. What's the what the lyrics? Oh, I do like to be beside the seaside. Oh, I do like to be beside the sea. I don't know the rest of the lyrics. I've got them here on my phone. And that sound I was trying to make is a sort of organ at the end of the pier in these kind of entertainment places you might hear it's very associated with the seaside this not a hammond organ what kind of organ is it i don't know it's just some sort of old-fashioned organ like before the days kind of wobbly sounding before the day before the day before the days of electric synthesizers and electric keyboards they use these old organs i'll play play a little example let's hear some organ music from the seaside all right Let's hear. I mean, it, you're going to hear a kind of a synthesizer version of an organ, mm-hmm. but it's still the same thing. It's fine. Let's let's see if we can make this work. Pretty accurate. Beside the sea, side behind the sea. Right. So that's that's the sort of thing you might hear at one of those working class uh, seaside resorts, like somewhere like Blackpool. The lyrics. Um, hold on a minute. Um, oh, oh God. how do I get back to the lyrics? Have a banana. Hold on. Let me desperately try and find the lyrics here for this. Okay. All right. Here they are. Oh, I do like to be beside the seaside. Oh, I do like to be beside the sea. Oh, I do like to stroll along the prom, prom, prom. What's the prom? The promenade. What's the promenade? Bit like a pier. Well, the promenade is basically the thing on the side that goes along the length of the beach. So you've got the water, the sand, and then the promenade, and then the buildings. Yes. Right? So the promenade is like a paved walkway that you can walk along. Yeah. And that's where you get all things like the, the, you know people selling ice cream and candy floss and stuff like that as well all that shit and maybe there would be um it back in the olden days there'd be a brass band on the promenade right so i oh, i do like to stroll along the prom 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 where the brass bands play tiddly on pom pom so just let me be beside the seaside i'll be beside myself with glee and the lyrics go on for there's lots of girls beside I should like to be beside, beside the seaside, beside the sea. Lots of, what's the bit about the girls? So let me be beside the seaside. I'll be by, by be. There's lots of girls I'd myself. like to be beside. 
beside the seaside. Well, there's lots of girls beside, meaning... As well. As well. I should like to be beside. I'd I'd like like to be next to. Beside the seaside. Beside the sea. Beside the sea. (laughs) (laughs) So just let me be beside the seaside. I'll be beside myself with glee, meaning I'll be very happy. And be the... beside yourself means you're so excited you're almost jumped out of your own body. I'm I'm beside I'm myself. Beside myself means I'm. I'm <laughs> I've had an out of body experience. It's true though. I'm beside myself with glee means I'm very happy. For there's lots of girls beside. I should like to be beside beside the sea side beside the sea. Like Oi! basically early form of rap music. <laughs> <laughs> very clever wordplay there. Um. So that we talked about walking along the promenade. You have to walk along the promenade, to, no matter what the weather. Um, what else have we got? I've got some other things here. Uh, holiday camps. Butlins. Uh, yeah, they're the old-fashioned holiday camps, which basically used to be package holidays for people who didn't want to, you know, who, who wanted a simple holiday experience. You pay one price, and it includes basic accommodation, entertainment, and uh food and and probably food as well probably not booze though but the booze yeah. would be very cheap you have to pay for the booze alcohol that is yeah um illuminations we talk about we've talked about like the blackpool <laughs> illumin the lights that they have there like a a, a, a low rent version of uh, las vegas fun fairs amusements the end of the pier so at the end of the pier is a phrase that we use to describe certain kind of very popular entertainment so if something is described as being end of the pier, it means it's kind of like... Slightly sim- crude, rude humour. Crude, simple, rude, crowd-pleasing humour. That's end of the pier stuff. Donkey rides. You get you get donkey rides at the beach in England. God knows where the donkeys come from. But, Poor little things. But they have donkeys on the beach and kids can, you know, you, you pay a little bit of money and your kid can ride a donkey up and down the beach. That's entertainment, folks. That's entertainment. Punch and Judy shows. That's the sort of thing you'd find at the beach and maybe God, the old days. We're going day, back days. into time now, aren't yeah, we? Yeah, Punch and Judy is something they also have in, in France. But um, Punch What do they call it in France? The Guignol. Oh, Guignol. I can't remember. I can't remember the it's name It's a puppet it. show. It's a puppet show, but it's a weird puppet show. Very violent. It's a puppet show for kids. Basically, the, the, it's like a pop-up theatre for children. And you imagine a, a, a kind of a thing that a man could stand inside, like a box that a man could stand in. And up above him, he holds his hands up. You can't see the man because he's covered. He's inside the box. But he holds his hands up. It's like a little mini theatre up there. It's like a little stage. And he holds his hands up and he's got two puppets. Can, and he does a show. Well, loads of puppets. There's, um, there's Punch, who's the man. There's who's, Judy, who's who's an, an aggressive drinking alcoholic. Alcoholic. There's Judy, his wife, and they beat each other up. Yeah, she hits there's, him with a rolling pin, and he beats her up. There's a baby which gets thrown around between them. Yeah, and the baby gets thrown up in the air. It's quite clever. The the, the puppet master, puppet bloke. Yeah, can f- make it so that the the puppets can throw this little baby up and down mm-hmm. and catch it again and it's, slap it onto the it's ground. Actually, and, it's actually when you look at it it's properly, very it's, sick. It's a very frightening scene of domestic and there's violence. always a crocodile as well there's a crocodile in there as well and isn't there a police officer as there's well there's a policeman so it's basically a form of knockabout slapstick entertainment for children which actually when you look at it properly is a scene of domestic violence it's, it's disturbing but there it is that's the kind of thing that people used to use as entertainment sort of how many years ago 50 to 100 years ago 100 to and they're still ago. going probably it's the sort of thing that people uh, look back on with nostalgic, you know, with nostalgia. But we had a, a Punch and Judy show come to our school. Yeah, when we were kids, I remember seeing one mm-hmm. and being pretty blown away by it as a child. What being I was very impressed? Yeah, I'm slightly scared as well. But it's it's amazingly skillful the way the guy can manipulate these puppets to, especially when the baby got thrown around. Yeah, I was thinking, how the hell does he do that? Because they catch it with a puppet. Yeah, and they slam it into the ground and then toss it <laughs> with these. The, instead of hands, the the puppets have like these little paddles. Yeah, like little flat little paddles. Yeah, that, their <laughs> hands are like these flat. And things. it's very noisy. And the guy speaks with a little thing in his mouth that makes him all talk like that. It's like a little kazoo that <laughs> he kind of speaks like this. It's, it's mental, weird. very mental. Weird. 
Um, and uh, yeah, it's the sort of thing that you know foreigners who hadn't grown up in the UK would come and see it and think, "What on earth is this? This is really weird." It well, is yep. really, it is really weird. Most countries have got very weird things. You know, when you think about it, uh, most countries do weird, weird stuff um, that you don't question because you just grew up with it. Um, swimming in the sea. In England. I have done. I used to do it a lot, and I've swum in sea in the sea a lot in England and in Scotland, where it's very cold. Mm-hmm. Um, and it's something you should do if you can. Uh, I couldn't be bothered this time because I'm very lazy. Um, but uh, be careful out there, yeah. So swimming in the sea in in England, it depends kind of where you are. So we were on the south coast. The water is relatively warm down there. So I went in. If you paddle in the water, that means just walking up to your your knees or something. Paddling can it can be like, oh wow, it's actually quite cold, isn't it? But when you really go for it, you walk in up to your waist. That's when it's like, oh, oh my god, this is uh, you know when the water hits your balls. Oh, that's um, quite an invigorating experience. But then you have to just go for it. It's kind of one of those things where it's like, oh, 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 come on, let's do this, oh, and you go in. And once you're in, it's not that bad. It's um, it's quite refreshing. And, and you nice. come out and you feel much better. Yeah, you feel really great when you come out. But some places in England, the water is freaking freezing. Okay, we're talking about the North Sea. Yeah, so, the North Sea is very, very cold. So on the on the north east coast, ladies and gents, you're, you're swimming in the North Sea, which is really cold. Um, and uh, but people do it. People go and swim in that. People do it on New Year's Day and things like that. People on New Year's in Day, in, in the middle of winter, people are jumping in the sea on uh, you know the first of January or a Boxing Day or any time of year. But for a summer holiday where you'd normally expect people to be bathing in you know in the crystal clear sort of um, Caribbean waters or something, uh, in, if you're in Skegness or something on the, the northeast coast and you swim in the sea, I mean that that. That's dangerously cold water, uh, probably, um, and uh, and that's it. That's that's all I've got now on my bits of paper. I've used all the notes up. Sorry for coming across as aggressive towards you in that, James. But I'm just trying, as I said, I'm just trying to keep the emotional in- uh, engagement okay. up. Okay. And as you recline and get more relaxed, I have to get more uh, animated. animated. You see, because if we both reclined and relaxed as much as you did with your eyes closed and you're doing now then i just feel like the whole thing would just grind to a halt so have you ever fallen asleep during a podcast i haven't but i'm sure they have yeah in fact i get reports all the time of people saying i love your podcast it really helps me fall asleep oh okay (laughs) (laughs) fine well you know whatever does it for you as long as as long as you're not doing that while you're driving then i'm happy good point yeah Okay, well, anyway, th- our holidays come to an end, James. Yeah. Our holidays come to an end. Bummer. Uh, I'm going back to France tomorrow with the wife and kid. Uh, I'm going back to that London. <laughs> Listen to him yawning. If you're not asleep now, folks, listening to my brother yawning oh will do it for you. you know, I'm just thinking about going back to work. <sighs> me too. I've got to go back to work Monday morning. I'm teaching intensive... English classes, that means six hours a day. How intense is it? As in, uh, well, how intense could it be? Right. Okay, you got, you know, like hair dryer <laughs> in the face kind of stuff. It's like boot camp. Yeah. Uh, how intense do you think they would like it to be? Right. You are now going to learn English. English, motherfucker. Do you speak it? <laughs> what country are you from? What? What in the country I ever heard of? They speak English or what? <laughs> the Samuel L. Jackson School of Teaching the, English. The Samuel L. Jackson School, the Pulp Fiction School of English Teaching. It's a good sketch idea. It's, yeah, it could. Well, it, they did it in the film, didn't they? Oh yeah. But um, he wasn't actually literally talking about learning English, though, was he? he was but just, intensive general English, yeah, intensive English classes. The idea is that it's like you know six hours a day for five days, thirty hours of English crammed into a week. Uh, it's called intensive, an intensive course. But yeah, I mean, I could make it more intense for them. You could introduce 
snakes into the class maybe. exactly that would be pretty intense yeah like really quick da- really dangerous ones those very, ones that one bite you're just dead in five like the, minutes the, the, the black mamba from wherever it is in africa which is a yeah. deadly snake one bite and you the whole family is dead electrify the floor or um hit them with a big whippy stick or just have very loud music playing all the time and, and flashing lights mm. make Strobe- it stop stroboscopic lights that would give people <laughs> epileptic fits <laughs> um, is this intense enough for you <laughs> or just <laughs> pack them all into the back of a car and just drive around paris at the at high speed you know and while, while screaming at them while, in while english while shouting out words from the dictionary in a, into a loudspeaker you know those like uh what are those loudspeakers that you can hold in your hand megaphone a megaphone i've just got a megaphone in one hand and a dictionary in the other hand a phrasal verb dictionary and i'm just shouting phrasal verbs at them yeah that would be intense <sighs> yeah well well maybe sort of throwing rocks in their direction in that's intensive general english you need an intensive english course james um. just to wake you up But I mean, as I said, listeners, to be fair to James, it is way past both of our bedtimes and he should be asleep at this point. So don't hold it against him or me or you. Don't don't hold anything against anyone and we'll be okay. All right. I'm sure we've forgotten something. about. We must have, of course. Listeners, if you know something else about the the culture of the English seaside. Write below. Write in in comment and uh, like and subscribe. uh, Write your comments in the comments section. Don't forget to uh, click that like button and uh, subscribe to the podcast on iTunes. And uh, You know what I saw the other day? Someone had written, don't forget to smash that like button till it goes red. (laughs) (laughs) Um, Smash the like button. Don't just click like. You have to smash the like button. Disgusting. What's wrong with Until it goes red. What's wrong with these people? He was on YouTube or something. Uh smash that like button until it goes red I mean, like, what, what, and it what, was like some young kid i think it was a skateboarding thing why is that why is that weird just it's just horrible I, you, I want you to spell that out for everyone listening why is that weird and horrible? i don't know i just didn't i just think this whole culture of being an internet person personality is i mean i know <laughs> i know that's basically what you are <laughs> no but you're not do you're doing you're doing valuable work you're not just uh, selling bullshit. You're but anyway, folks, don't English. forget to smash that like button until it goes <laughs> red, okay? And like and subscribe. And uh, what's, what are the other things that they say on YouTube? Leave a comment in the comments section. I'm giving a free PS4 giveaway. All you need to do is smash that like button. Leave a comment in the comments section. One of you is going to receive a PS4. Disclaimer, no one's going to receive a PS4. Yeah. Um. Did, anyway, well, uh, did you have a good holiday, James? Yeah, it was lovely, and I don't really want to go back to normal life. No one does. Nobody does. We all understand exactly how you feel. Okay, folks. Well, uh, it's been great to talk to you again on the podcast. And uh, if if you, if anyone out there is uh, thinking of uh, taking a holiday on the English seaside, I would recommend going down to the Jurassic Coast. There, it was genuinely really nice. It was. Uh, any of you know uh, the TV show Broadchurch, quite a famous TV show with David Tennant and Olivia Coleman, Broadchurch. Some of you might have seen it. There's that, where that was filmed, that beach with that big orange cliff. It's not really orange, sort of brown, orangey brown. That's where, that's one of the places we visited while we were there. So there you go. All right. Yeah. Um, come to the British seaside. Come to the British seaside and get inspired to write a sort of... Uh, Award-winning murder mystery novel. Exactly. Okay. We look forward to reading your <laughs> novels, ladies and gents. James, say goodbye to the people of the world. Bye, listener. You're not supposed to refer to it as, as everyone. You're supposed really? to speak to an individual. Okay, well, you can say goodbye to... Thanks for we, listening. What should we call uh, this person? Well, you don't have to call... You don't how, do, to. how do I know? It's just... It's, it's, there's, there's more than one person listening yeah, to this. there's only... Each listener is an individual... Oh, I, I know what you're saying. That The idea is that you're supposed to talk to the listener as if it's one individual person. Yes. Hello, not, you. How are you? Yeah, like that. More personal. Not like, hey, everybody, because that just seems a bit like... Impersonal. Imper- imper- yes. You, you know English quite well, don't you? 
<laughs> <laughs> well, thanks, listener. Thanks for listening. Thanks um, to hope you. you have a nice rest of day slash evening. And uh, come visit the British seaside sometime. It's not as bad as we made it sound like. Correct. Okay. Okay, good night. Bye. Bye. I wandered into your wonderland Right, so there you have it. We managed to talk about the English seaside while maintaining consciousness throughout. We didn't fall asleep. So I'd like to thank James again for his participation and for not falling asleep at any point during the the conversation. Um, Like I said at the beginning, listening back to that, I didn't sound like I was frustrated at all, right? I thought I'd get more angry and irritated than that. I mean, I thought that uh, when I... When we were recording it, I was thinking, oh, I f- I- I'm sure I come across as being a bit irritable. But listening back to it, we both just seemed quite relaxed and having a good time. Uh, so all in all, it- I think it was a nice one, wasn't it? I hope you enjoyed spending that time with us in audio form. So I, I hope you liked it and-, and that it gave you a flavour of what it's like to-, to visit the beach in England. Have a look at the page for this episode on the website. You will find some visuals there. Uh, to you know, show you some things we were talking about, things like uh, you know, Punch and Judy shows and some of the slightly risque um, postcards. Risque, that means kind of sexually suggestive. Risque, that's quite a good word, isn't it? Um, it's like risky, but sort of like pronounced as in the French way, risque. So slightly indecent, like slightly rude, liable to shock, especially being a bit sexually suggestive. So we talked about sort of sexually suggestive and risque um, postcards. So you'll be able to see some some of that kind of stuff just to give you a flavour of that kind of cheap and cheerful fun that you would get at the at the typical sort of working class English seaside holiday resort. So check out the page for this episode on the website. You'll see visuals there and also a transcript for the intro and also this ending bit that you're listening to now. So just a reminder then before we go, there is a Lepster meetup happening in London this coming Sunday, the 28th of July, 2019 from 2 p.m. at the Fitzroy Tavern near Oxford Street and Tottenham Court Road. The postcode for your Google Maps app or equivalent is W1T2LY, the Fitzroy Tavern. Uh, Full address, 16 Charlotte Street, Fitzrovia, London, W1T2LY. And yes, I can confirm that I will be coming too. So I'll I'll, I'll turn up, I'll pop in um, and stay for a while, probably with James himself and a couple of our friends as well. If you're coming, let the meetup host know. That's Zdenek. You can email him at teachersdenek uh, at gmail.com just to let him know. If you're wondering which one he is, if you're thinking, how will I know which one is Zdenek? Well, he will be the guy with the board games. Zdenek uh, loves using board games in his English lessons, and he'll be bringing the board games with him uh, just for a bit of fun. So you can have fun, chat, play board games. It's going to be great. It's going to be totally great. Oh, God, why did I do that impression? I don't know why. I don't know. So anyway, it's going to be great. So, uh, what what impression, Luke? What are you talking about? I so I slightly slipped into a Donald Trump impression. It's kind of like something that I do sometimes without intending to do it. I'll say it's going to be great, and then I just kind of go into like it's going to be totally great, the greatest. It'll be the greatest meetup ever. And it's not even a very good impression. Anyway, moving swiftly on, I hope to see you there if you're in London. I might only be able to stay for a little bit, perhaps an hour or so, I don't know, but it would be good to meet you and we can chat in English a bit, perhaps have a drink, maybe play a board game. We will see. Also, premium subscribers, hello. I am working on some material for you which will arrive soon, okay? That's going to contain the usual language teaching to help you improve your vocab, grammar and pronunciation. If you're interested in becoming a premium subscriber to get access to all of the premium episodes, and there are loads of them now, go to teacherluke.co.uk slash premium and you can sign up there. Then use your login details that you create when you sign up to sign into the LEP app to listen to the premium episodes. How do I get the LEP app, Luke? Just go to the app store on your phone, the Play Store for Google, Android or the App Store on iOS 
and search for Luke's English Podcast app, okay? So when you've become a member through teacherluke.co.uk slash premium, use your login details to sign into the app. And uh, that's how you can listen to all the premium content in the app, okay? Uh, Also, any technical support issues that you have about your premium subscription, you can directly email support at libsyn.com. Support, you know, at Libsyn, that's L-I-B-S-Y-N dot com, L-I-B-S-Y-N, Libsyn. Uh, Libsyn is my podcast host. They're probably the biggest podcast host in the world, I would say. Probably the number, the, the sort of the market leader in terms of podcast hosting. Uh, lots of people use Libsyn. So uh, they also handle my premium service. So if you've got a technical question or some sort of query about your premium subscription, uh, email support at libsyn.com and make sure that you mention that you are a subscriber to Teacher Luke, the premium content from Teacher Luke. Teacher Luke is like the code, the name that you will need to use to make sure that they know which service it is. You can say, I subscribe to Teacher Luke's premium content um, and you'll need to quote the email address, you know, your login details as well when you email them. Okay, so that's it then. Until next time, and I'm not sure when next time will be, but I'm still teaching crazy, crazy intensive lessons at the British Council this week, but that stops on Friday. Then I'll be going to London. I'll be going back to back home on Monday, and uh, then I've got like a few days to, um, to to work on more material for you before things get crazy again, and I'll be going traveling again, going on holiday and stuff again. So August might be busy for me, uh, but I'll, I'm attempting to publish content, premium content and normal content during August uh, to give you stuff to listen to okay but the but it's still a bit of a busy time I'm not complaining about being busy no I like it but I'm just saying why you might not get the the usual amount of content that you have uh, grown to expect over the years just summer it's always like this in summer isn't it the number of podcasts goes down a little bit anyway until next time I shall bid ye farewell in the usual way by saying this you know what i'm going to say i'm going to say like goodbye and then fade out slowly like normal okay all right let's do it now then all right so speak to you soon maybe see you on sunday but for now goodbye bye 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 for listening to Luke's English Podcast. For more information, visit teacherluke.co.uk.